Greetings, and welcome to today's edition of Catching Up with Katie. I'm Kathleen O'Connor Ives, your state senator, and I'm always happy to be here at HC Media giving you updates at the local, state, and national level regarding events that are important to the residents of the city of Haverhill. And for today's guest, we're very fortunate to have Haverhill City Councilor Colin LePage joining us. Welcome, Colin. Thank you, Katie. It's great to be here. I'm excited to have you on the show today because there's a lot that we have in common in terms of our scope of work. You do that every day at the city level, and I'm working in tandem with you. And what I wanted to kick today's show off with is a, a discussion regarding the opioid crisis that's in Haverhill, but also statewide, affecting all 351 cities and towns. And we live really close to Maine and New Hampshire as well, so there's a lot of crossover there. In my office, it's important for residents to know that we get calls frequently from constituents looking for access to services. So whether that's in search of an open treatment bed for someone who's looking for that opportunity or someone who is trying to navigate insurance difficulties to get that insurance coverage they need. And often they're just trying to figure out how to navigate some aspect of the state bureaucracy we might be able to help expedite. On the budgetary front, uh, in this year's budget, FY15, there's funding for different initiatives, including a heroin task force to help our first responders and to support them in that important work. And in the previous budget cycles, there's been consistent funding. We're pushing for increased funding for FY17 because this is an issue that feels very recent, but we're just catching up in terms of responding to this. And there's really no end in sight, so we have to budget for it. And thirdly, in terms of legislation, the legislature's passed two bills. I know you're very familiar with them. The first one was focused on expanding treatment options because it is unacceptable if someone wants a bed and there is no bed for that precious window when someone's looking for treatment. And then the second bill we did this year focused on addiction prevention and, and truly focused on the fact that prescription drugs are often the pipeline that triggers an addiction problem leading to more and more serious situations with a potential risk of overdose. So that in a nutshell is some of the work that happens from a, a state legislator perspective. But I'd love for you to touch upon some of the work the city of Haverhill, as well as yourself as an individual counselor, are focused on as you address this and want to provide solutions. Well. One of the things you said as far as like beds and such like that, one, and, and the way you said it is as far as the window. Mm -hmm. the, the folks who are suffering with, with these issues, it's a very limited window from when they are ready to say that they're looking for help. And like you said, there's bureaucracy and there's a long period of time before they can get somewhere. Their, their mind changes over that time. So there's times where all of a sudden they're, they're reaching out and looking for that, but if they can't be helped in that time frame, uh, there's things like through the courts where they do a section 35 and such and there's only a limited amount of time where someone who has an issue realizes they have an issue and, and is ready to to work to, to stop that I mean we all are imperfect people we all have things if it's an addiction to coffee or to cigarettes or something like that that you know we have an impulse to do something so these folks are in between that and trying to help themselves and if they can't get access to a bed then unfortunately they seem to go back into these cycles again and then even sometimes treatment isn't long enough for folks right. to get out. There's times when you go and you'll talk to folks. I'm sure you have a lot of people come to you. Um, recently, I've had more and more people come to me talking about long-term folks. We, we love to hear the success stories of folks who have been in long-term recovery, as they term it, and stuff like that. Um, but there's others that are struggling that maybe just for a few months or weeks, and then something happens in their life or something doesn't, that they go and and unfortunately, they've withdrawn or something's happened, and then they, we find out that there's a death. And, and that's happened, as you said, more and more. Um, as you said, statistically, and, and this has been around for a very long time, it just hasn't been as rampant as it seems to be now because of uh, new drugs, new synthetics, new things happening, people putting out there. And unfortunately, it's a business. There's folks that do deal with illegal drugs, and it's a business. But also, prescription drugs have also contributed to this. Um, if I could just say, so in 2015, just in Massachusetts, there was 1,379 deaths, 1,379 deaths in 2013. 
and I mean 2015. 2014, there was 1,282 deaths. And this is opioids. Now, this is where the, that seemed to be when we say heroin, then there's, there's, oh, people kind of get a thing. This is opioids, not always just heroin, yeah. because actually folks don't realize there's more opioid prescription deaths than there are actually heroin deaths. So that was an increase of over 41% from 2013. In 2012, there was less than 700 deaths. So this is really, as you said, is really ramped up. And back in two, 2000, it was only 338 deaths. So nationally, last year, there was almost 30,000 opioid deaths. So it's here in Haverhill, it's here in the Commonwealth, but it's across the whole nation. Mm -hmm. But as, if you do the numbers, 30,000 and 1,300, so that's it's a little higher here in Massachusetts and other places. Haverhill suffered 27 deaths last year and suffered 2000, uh, in 2014 suffered 32 deaths. As you know, I've also been reaching out to schools. I've been going to uh, middle schools and talking to kids about the, the dangers of starting and prevention. And you know, a couple of things have, that I've talked to kids recently um, in the middle schools, but one of the ones I told them is the statistics that, and it's in the paper, I have them all the time. You can't go through the paper for more than a couple of days without seeing something called the heroin crisis or something. And if it's not just the local paper, it's in the Boston Globe, there's something always being talked about with, with prescription painkillers and all. But as far as prevention and education, 94% of people addicted to drugs or alcohol start using between the ages of 12 and 25. That's 95, that's, al that's almost everybody. 40% mm -hmm. who start drinking at 15 years old will become alcoholics. Only 7% will become that when they're 21 years old. So it's just a matter of educating kids. So that was one of the big emphasis of saying we need middle school health care. And I think what happens is Havel, as you talk about budgets and such, mm -hmm. Havel has been, um, has had some hard times financially and all. And cuts were made, and it's not to fault anyone, but it would seem that you couldn't cut math, you couldn't cut science or social studies, but band could be cut, art could be cut, and health got cut. And I think we're, we're starting to see some of those things because that was cut over 10 years ago. I think. We're seeing that it's not all of it, I can't say that, but as I've explained and, and the school committee has seen, there's, Methuen is right next to us, and, and then Lawrence is there, and, and some, and I don't want to say anything detrimental about another community, but Methuen's rates are half of ours, and one thing could be shown is through the youth surveys is they had a lot more health teachers. So educating I, I kids. I wanted to take a step back, Colin, because I don't think that you're giving yourself enough credit for identifying this as an issue. If you could share with the voters the, the focus that you've had on having health instructors get geared back up into the school system as a strategy for addiction prevention. I think it's important to simply focus on the fact that that wasn't going to be in the cards and you've started an initiative paying attention to what the normal staffing level should be and how do we get Haverhill back up to it. Well, I can say fortunately we're going to be this coming school year, we'll be back to one health teacher in every middle school. So we'll be back to four. For over 10 years, we only had one. So if you think about the workload and what you can teach, if you have one teacher teaching a subject, and health is a, a year-round subject, but not just say that. As I would talk to the kids sometimes, i say, okay, I do math a little bit. I don't do as much science in my general work of life and all. Not that they're not important, but I live my life every day. I make decisions on if I'm going to have this glass of water or if I'm going to have a, a, a drink of beer or something or if I'm going to smoke a cigarette or if I'm going to take a drug or if I'm going to make fun of you and bully you or if I'm going to be precocious and, and have sex too early. There's a lot of things going on as through middle school. I mean, what do they say about high school? It's like some say it's the greatest times and a lot of folks says it's the worst times. They're going through adolescence and puberty. A lot of things have changed. There's a lot of things going on, comparing yourself to others and such like that. And as there's more media and all, I think it's even more from when I was a kid in school and what would happen and how people are, are separated and, and, and the cliques and, and such media. like that. And there's so much of that. So kids are exposed to a lot more. And if we're not giving them an education to things, I mean, one of the things as far as like cigarette smoke, there's less smoke as they say, but now vaping is the thing because that's the cool thing people look at and says, okay. and they're being marketed to as being that this is a safe way to doing this. Mm -hmm. 
get off of cigarettes but vape and that's better and it, <laughs> it's not really true. Or with the uh, perception that because medical marijuana is okay, recreational mm -hmm. is okay that's at okay. whatever age. Right, and I, and I think just the, the term, it's, a, it's called medical marijuana, and I'm not saying I'm against that. I would, and, and that was kind of the conversation that we had in the city earlier. It was a matter of how is it being done and how is it going to be regulated and is, is it done properly? Mm -hmm. And will folks who shouldn't have access to it, I wouldn't want to, same thing with opioids. There are folks that should have opioids. They should have things, but unfortunately the prescriptions of them were given so for convenience, instead of you getting something because you just had surgery and it should be, you should have this for a week and all, then we'll come back to me. Well, convenience is I'll give you a 30-day supply and then we'll see what happens. Well, they say addiction happens over 10 days. Mm -hmm. So if you're taking something and you're not worried of that, then you can do that. They talk about, you know, doing habits and all like that. I've been walking lately. I like to, to walk, but if I don't walk for a couple of days, it's easier to just, uh, well, I didn't walk the last two days. I can stop walking the third day and and then that habit doesn't stay. You have to do something for a period of time. So the idea with kids in school is you have them there and you can teach them all kinds of things. It's not just drug and substance abuse. But if that was one thing that should have been going for five weeks, but they had to teach the whole curriculum, they could only maybe have one or two classes about that. So everything had to be constrained because there was only one teacher going to one school for a quarter of the curriculum. And like I said, when the, the kids are at school, I think they should be being taught by teachers in all different subjects. And like I said, with all the things in, in the social norms, health teachers are going to go to. I would talk and say, if I had a math problem, I didn't go to the science teacher to ask her for a tutoring. So if you have something that's going on that you're being bullied or you're a friend or something's happening with their parents or someone else, someone's having suicidal thoughts, mm -hmm. who do they go to? They're not going to go to the math teacher. They're going to go to someone they trust. And usually, if the health teacher is the one who's talking about those things. So, uh, and. At the high school, they actually have a drug council now that they had um, that they're realizing, I think, amongst other things, in mental health, as you mentioned, Department of uh, Public Health and Mental Health, it, there's more, I think, that needs to be known. These are things that people didn't really want to talk about. And I can say the same thing. The opioid crisis, no one really wanted to talk about it until the numbers started to get so high and that also that you would find out that when you talk to someone, they would know that. I met, um, I met Governor Baker. And when I met him and having a conversation with him, he would tell me that he would see people and it'd be one out of every two or one out of every three would be telling me that there was something, someone or some family that they knew. And as I've talked with him and I've talked with Senator Markey and I've talked with uh, Congresswoman Songus about these things and, and others along with you and of course our whole local delegation, you find that there's a lot more people that really don't want to talk about the issue publicly. Mm -hmm. They'll talk about it privately. Um, and they don't want to do that, but then they realize that, you know what, there's a lot more people. And when people realize that they're not the only one, I think that there's more that they'll more free to talk about it. No, that's very true. And it's not only opioid addiction, but addiction of, of a whole host of substances mm -hmm. where there is very likely a mental health component. And uh, it's, it's a complicated, lifelong issue to address very often. So that get, gets back to your point where it's not about just having a bed available. It's how much time is going to be appropriate for each person and what treatment is appropriate because there are different options. There's not one silver bullet that's going to address an addiction problem for any one individual and that's what makes it all the more complicated and it might not happen the first time or the second time. So it's, a, it's often a lifelong investment once this gets triggered and that's why prevention, like you said, is so important. So I, I thank you and, and congratulate you on the focus on the restaffing of, of the health teachers at the schools. It's important. And we appreciate everything that the state's doing to help us. A uh, quick pivot to another initiative, another mm -hmm. column a page initiative. <laughs> I think it's important for viewers to also know that there's another aspect of municipal government that you've been focusing on for a lot of years, and that is solid waste reduction oh, and okay. your recycling initiatives. So. I know about it, but I wonder if you could briefly talk about the progress that's happened over the years and update us on what might be coming down the pike for solid waste reduction and recycling. Well, I think, um, I think we realized this uh, a few years ago. And there was, I could say as far as like a campaign of looking at it when I did it before I became on the council and uh, with folks from Team Haverhill and the Haverhill Environmental League and and other folks just looking and saying, basically, I thought, 
why are we spending so much money on something? And what can we do? And who would have really, I didn't think trash would fight back as far as being a, a political <laughs> enemy and such like that. So looking at it and looking at the numbers, it was like, what could happen? The simple thing was that if we were to take this item, and I, if I could have yours for a moment, your, your cup here, and say, I'm gonna fill these up the things I no longer want. We went out and we bought some groceries and we have some cans for, from soup that we had and we have packaging and we have all these things we don't want them anymore. If I put them in this one, at that time, the city was gonna get $22. But if I put them all over here, it was costing the city $55. And I thought that was just a pretty simple thing to say, I'd rather have the city receive $22 than have to pay $55. And then when we save this money, we could use it for other things. Mm -hmm. At the time, I didn't know about health teachers, but there was, we've always had needs for more police, more fire, more teachers, more things that we need, improving, maintaining buildings. We have a lot of financial needs that, why are we th literally throwing money away over here when we didn't have to? And I mean, statistically, I could say over almost, actually two thirds, two thirds of things that we throw away are recyclable. So if you just would say half of it, if we could just separate that out, the state at the time, the average was 36%. So a third of the state average was recycling a third of what they were throwing away. Haverhill was at less than 10%. Could you repeat that? So the, when you would take all 351 you know, uh, communities in the Commonwealth mm -hmm. and you would say, okay, what's their recycling rate? What they would say is, okay, here's the total stuff that they got rid of. These were the recyclables, and this was the trash uh -huh. that they didn't want anymore. And they said, okay, this is the total. They said 36% was the average was recycling put in way. here. It was the recycling. Okay. That's what they called the recycling. Yep. They've changed the term a little bit now. So that was it. Haverhill's was less than 10. Okay. So the idea was if you could increase this, you could have savings mm -hmm. and save money. Mm -hmm. So over that time, since we did this in 2010, we've saved over a million dollars. Okay. That if we just kept doing what we're doing, 10% here and print the 90% here, we would have paid over a million extra dollars than we had, so the taxpayers would have spent that money. Mm -hmm. If we were able, and we got up to 18%, so in a few years we were able to double our number, we ramped it up, it was pretty good, but we've been sitting at that number for the last couple of years. We haven't been able to increase that and have more people put things in the recycling bin. If we had done that, if we had got to our goal of the state average, like it's, that's only half, it's as only as good as half the cities and towns in the Commonwealth, we would have saved over one and a half million dollars mm -hmm. in that time frame. So what's happening now is, is basically reducing the amount of trash you could put out. So the city now has a TOTO program. So an automated TOTO program where instead of having three barrels of trash, you can have only one barrel. But that one barrel equals two barrels. It's a 64-gallon TOTO. So that is one way, as they say, like carrot and stick is kind of incentivizing folks that if you get it to fit in that barrel, that other stuff you'll look at a little bit more and say, you know what? That, that can and that glass bottle and and all that paper and all I should be putting it over here and they'll certainly pick up all of that no no charge mm -hmm. city's not charging for the toter but if you exceed over the toter you can buy overfill bags mm -hmm. so I don't think people want to do that I don't want to do that mm -hmm. I, can, <laughs> I recycle re relatively well so I, I don't have that problem but it's again just a, a, an education all at the time that we did it, we went from five barrels the city would allow five and we took it down to three and there was really not much complaint. And we didn't just go and do two barrels just because it sounded better. It was, well, they went out, we had a recycling coordinator through state grant, and that person went out and did a survey of all the ones as they were picking things up, and they said, okay, most, you know, the average is less than two barrels of trash, is what it is. Now, of course, that's the average. There's folks who may have been at five, and there was some that might be very small. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, what the city's doing with that. So hopefully we'll see even more savings and we can use that money for other purposes than you know, literally throwing it away. Mm -hmm. It's a little, you know, it's a change of things. It's you know, a little inconvenient. Like I said, I won't say it's an addiction or a habit, but folks are in the habit of doing something for a way. It's kind of modifying their, their habits and behavior a little bit. Is it weird to be re like addicted to recycling? <laughs> I'm addicted to recycling. <laughs> I go in barrels. I think it's a, I, like I said, <laughs> I think there's some good addictions, they say, yeah. and some, but things, you know, too much from an extreme is, I, I don't think there's that much. And, and some people think it's, it's much more dif difficult than it, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, folks will ask me about how much do I have to rinse out the peanut butter jar? How much do I have to do this? So you just fill it with a little water, hot water, shake it up, 
and let it sit and all like that, or, or throw it out. It's, it's going to a trash facility. It's not sterile. No one's going to take it and now use it for medical purposes and all like right. that. It's, it's going somewhere else where they're going to take a whole lot of it, separate it and sort it and all like that. It's going to get a little dirty. It's okay. You don't have to spend a lot of time cleaning it out. Mm -hmm. We have that shared interest in uh, solid waste reduction and mm -hmm. different environmental issues. And you and I have also been very interested in the, the Clean River Project. Yeah. Some of the initiatives that are happening along the Merrimack River. I know that we've worked together on the River Cities Initiative, trying to make the Merrimack River more navigable, cleaner. And you've gotten actually in the river. Yeah, you got to do the work. You can't just talk about it. Pulling Katie. out tires. Is that <laughs> is that something that... Uh, you enjoy and I, plan on I, doing more of? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I need to find other hobbies, but I, yeah, <laughs> I've done that the last couple of seasons and I look forward to uh, working with Rocky again and hopefully again some other folks and uh, maybe some of the councils or other folks that get in the river and mm -hmm. just, you know, spend a few hours in there pulling out ties. Unfortunately, there's a lot of ties. Right. <laughs> there's a, and a lot of other debris that's in there. But like I said, we can't seem to dredge it. They won't let us dredge it. In some ways, I think this is gentle dredging is what we're doing. And, and, and those things shouldn't be in there. I think Rocky's count, you can tell me, I think he's over 50 cars that he's right. pulled out. Yep, for out folks of the river. that don't know, there's a nonprofit organization called the Clean River Project. And Rocky Morrison heads that up with an amazing group of volunteers up and down the Merrimack River, basically making sure that the trash below the water and above the water is reduced as much as possible and they tow out cars and tires and they have these trash booms that collect trash along mm -hmm. the river and uh, not only is the river a drinking water source for a lot of people but it's a it's a recreational gem and folks aren't gonna like it if there's debris everywhere and it's not gonna get collected by magical little fairies that come <laughs> around so people like you and Rocky do that good work but uh, you should add, like you said, so say that again, give him a plug here so folks who, who are watching can maybe contribute because you've been able to put some money to that and that's a great cause in helping him and, and others do what they're doing as far as getting him grant money and such like that. But he could always use volunteers and also use money to help him continue doing what he does. I mean, it's a volunteer nonprofit entity. And I know that he also does corporate events. If people want to have a river cleanup day through their work mm -hmm. or office, they, they do that as well. And whatever folks don't see on the river doesn't mean it wasn't there. It's being collected upriver right. so that folks downriver don't have to be subjected to it. So I wanted to mention that as well. And, uh, and then as in addition to recycling, energy, tires, oh. innovation. Mm -hmm. I wanted to spend some time before the conclusion of the show to ask you about your general approach to being a city councilor because I used to be a city councilor. I know how that can be and there's no book on how to do it. There's no manual. So in terms of how you approach the day-to-day -day business of city government, I think that it would be helpful for people to understand whether it's a city council meeting or the work that happens after the meetings are done, your perspective on how you do your job. Um, like I said, there is no book. I know when I first was given an orientation, here's the things, and this is what you're doing. I'd, obviously, I'd watched before and watched and saw, looked at agenda items and meetings and stuff like that, but there's no knowledge that you, you just come into it with. So it's a matter of, okay, how do you do your job versus what I do in, in my regular employment? So this is above and beyond. So I looked at it a little bit as I used to volunteer. I used to do a lot of work with uh, Riverside Bradford Baseball. I'm also a volunteer with Team Haverhill. So in my aspect of running, and I did run Riverside Bradford as the president for quite a few years, had an idea how I go about working with folks and how to schedule things and such like that. The city was a little different in how things are done. So they have a set formula of doing things, and okay, and go through that. and then. How do you find out about things? So th there is, there's a lot of history to Haverhill that unfortunately I, I haven't been here my whole entire life. So just meeting constituents and, and finding out something and they, sometimes they talk about places that I know is what they are now versus they talk about what they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and just asking councils who were there before me, talking with the mayor and others and okay, what is it to do? Here's a topic that comes on the agenda. I'd like to f see whatever the topic is and if I haven't generated it myself because I have a question or some of the things we've talked about is then to research. Just do as much research and be as knowledgeable because as we are here or on the camera and don't want to look and like you're not sure what's going on or informed of it. I sometimes get feedback that I don't talk enough. Sometimes say you seem to do all the research but you don't talk about it. I'm like I just don't realize I should do that more often. 
that folks don't know that I have. But um, I think as I do it, I just try to gather as much information as I can. So when I have to make a vote or make a decision on something, I have all the information. And you, as we know, there's more than just two sides to every story. And sometimes we're only given one, and sometimes in a very short manner. Mm -hmm. So the agenda comes to us. Actually, today's Friday. We will close at 11. There's not a whole lot of time if there's big items that come up. We're not always given a whole lot of um, information prior to something happening. I mean, let's say we're in budget season right now. So we were given a budget book a little over a month ago, go through the whole book, look at where it's been in the past. I look back at past budget books prior to that one, prior to that, what are our trends? I go and look and say, okay, so I can ask questions. What are we spending money on? What's our priorities for? Are we meeting all our needs? And then consistents will tell you a lot sometimes. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, that's fine. We don't need money for that. Or like I said, the health teacher was something that I don't think anyone really realized. It was something they did. They wanted to re reinstitute the program to full, having full curriculum and having teachers and all, but it just was something that over time people didn't look at and say it was, it's nice to do, but didn't see if they could find the money. So I think if you have something to look for and say, okay, how can I make something happen? You look to find ways. And unfortunately, a lot of it has to do with money and sometimes. Right. So we have to live within what the budget is, but there's times you can question is money being spent here on, a, on a, something or could it be delayed for something else and how do we prioritize things and should we charge more for something or should we not charge anything at all for something? Mm -hmm. So there's that and like I said, I, I really enjoy doing it. Like I said, I think it's, it's somewhat, I look at it as an extension of what I did uh, working with kids in baseball and also doing some work with Team Haverhill and then Every now and then, like I said, the Clean River Project, I'm not working with Rocky all the time, but whenever he's in this area, I'll do that. And, you know, I, that's, I just want like to have the satisfaction of doing a good job. And that's what I've tried to do. I know that we're coming toward the conclusion of the show, but if you could briefly touch upon another Colin LePage initiative, I describe as a teacher residency program. That's a good, that's a good name for it, because that's what we talked about in the past. Uh huh. So uh, when I first got on the council, it was something that I, I looked into and we talked about. It. So sometimes timing and events happen and such. So with the development of downtown, I looked into when I was hearing things about teachers. Again, unfortunately, it wasn't about health teachers, just teachers in general mm -hmm. and how they're paid and, and what happens in the city. Because I think when I first got on, there was issues with the teachers and their contract. And I read about what happens in Boston, what happens in Chicago, is they have programs where they go and they recruit young teachers to come in into urban settings, as in Haverhill, and they either can do a variety of things as far as maybe helping them subsidize housing, mm -hmm. and they make a commitment back that they will stay here. Uh, some of the teachers I would talk to in the beginning, the president of the unit at the time would tell me, he would relate it to me as in baseball terms. He says, and they don't exist anymore, but the Montreal Expos, they had Pedro Martinez was on their team. They had a lot of stars, but once those young stars became well-known stars, they wanted to get paid and they would leave Montreal because they didn't have any money. So that's what would happen. He would say, we have the same thing. We have a lot of young teachers that come through, but then they'll move on. We can't retain them. So I said, well, what if we had a place that they sign up for a few years and either they get maybe part of their student loan to pay it off or housing, or can we make something like that and do a partnership? Mm -hmm. So I talked with a few folks about it, presented it a little bit, it kind of got shelved, and now with things happening, I would say with Harbor Place, a lot more development downtown, a lot more things happening. Um, I have a little more experience. I think people listen to me a little bit more, hopefully, because <laughs> I've been around, not just a, a, a first term or a second mm -hmm. term. So hopefully when you build up, I think you also have to build up credibility and all, and that you get some accomplishments that, that show that something's going on and, and, and to do that. So. Uh, it's being talked about. I've talked with the mayor about it. I've had other folks that are discussing it, and uh, Noah Koretz is one, and mm -hmm. talking about downtown and such like that, and saying, okay, can we do some kind of small pilot to, to do that? We have UMass Lowell coming now, mm -hmm. and working with those folks and seeing, okay, can we do something and have a, a small program, see how this works, and see if we can retain folks and, and lure people. I mean, we want people to come here. It's kind of like you said, the tourism thing. Get people to come in, invest in the city, and yeah. stay here. I mean, my story, and I, I've told it, quite a few times is I was in the city only three, four hours before I bought my house. I had hmm. never been to Haverhill in my whole entire life, never even heard of it. So, but just driving around, looking at all the opportunities, looking at all the wonderful things that are here, 
He said, you know, and I can afford it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not the only thing, but they were building schools in 97. They um, were Money Magazine, top 10, one of the places to live in the country because of its affordability and all other things. And I think we're, uh, we're coming back around to that again. Well, that, that's a great example to point to and how we have to continue that trend mm -hmm. where Haverhill can be a hub. Yeah, like so. you said, we're kind of like a hidden jewel. I think you've made those comments sometimes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and given your persistence, I know that the idea will certainly gain traction. I also wanted to give you an opportunity in regard to constituent interaction. What are some ways that residents can get in touch with you if they had questions about some of the work happening on the council or ideas and things like that? Um, so you can go to the city website, City of Haverhill City Council. It lists all the councils there, so our contact information is there. My email is clepage at cityofhaverhill.com. Uh, my home phone number is 978-372-8727. And through either the city council office or, or just contact me directly, either one of those two ways. And I get emails an awful lot, or I get some phone calls and stuff like that, and I, I work on those things. Um, you know. that, no, that's great because I think it's important for residents to know how accessible. And I'm sorry, the other thing is mm -hmm. Facebook. <laughs> this is the, the other the social media part of it. It's not a campaign season, so I also have a, a website that I have, okay. which I, I I keep running. But every two years when that election cycle comes out, I really kind of push that also. But there's a website also, uh, www.vote the number four colon dot com. Okay. That's that's the election stuff. But but the regular city of Haverhill business reach me there. Reach me on my phone number. And people can send you messages through send, Facebook. They can send me messages like me or, or friend me on Facebook and all like that, I get a few of those also. Okay, very good, because I think it's important for residents to know how accessible counselors are. Not only can they attend the city council meetings and mm -hmm. listen live, but they can also tune in on HC Media yep. from their homes. So it's not like their local government is very distant oh, or inaccessible. Accessible. I mean, we, we I, I see uh, constituents, someone had questions for me, Stop it in Dunkin' Donuts the other morning. It's somewhere else, like, uh, the market basket, there's someone asking some questions. So uh, had breakfast at Mark's Deli this morning. People asking me questions there also. That's great. That's great. And I know that the, the times run out very quickly here, but we covered some things. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have you back on in the future sure. so we can talk so more. Sure. So I did good? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. O off the charts in terms of uh, breadth of topic and uh, dedication to public service. So All right. thank you for your willingness to come on the show. Thank you. And, uh, and once again, I'd like to thank all of the guests for joining us for this edition of Catching Up with Katie. Today it was Catching Up with Colin and Katie, and we look forward to seeing you on a future show. Thanks for watching.